Welcome to our 100th episode, A Dream of St. John Bosco, titled The Two Calms. You're watching The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Subscribe for new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Imagine you dream about a naval battle between two fleets, one of which is captained by the Pope. Two massive columns are the destination of the Pope's ship, and an enemy fleet is attempting to prevent it from reaching this safe haven. A massive battle ensues. This is the supernatural vision that God sent to Don Bosco in the form of a dream, which I will relate to you in this episode. On May 26, 1862, St. John Bosco had promised the boys that he would tell them something pleasant on the last or second to the last day of the month. And so, at the good night talk on May 30th, he narrated this parable, or allegory as he chose to call them. A few nights ago, he said, I had a dream that I would like to tell you about. It's true, dreams are nothing but dreams, but still, I'll tell them to you for your spiritual benefit. Try to picture yourselves with me on the seashore, or better still, on an outlying cliff. The vast expanse of water is covered with a formidable array of ships in battle formation, prows fitted with sharp, spear-like spars capable of breaking through any defense. All are heavily armed with cannons, incendiary bombs, firearms, and other explosives. They're all heading toward one stately ship, mightier than them all. As they close in, they try to ram it, set it on fire, and cripple it as much as possible. A flotilla escort shields this stately vessel, and the winds and waves are with the enemy. Amid this endless sea, two solid columns soar high into the sky a short distance apart. At the very top of one is a statue of the Immaculate Virgin, at whose feet a large inscription reads, Auxilium Christianorum, Help of Christians. On top of the other, far loftier and sturdier, supports a sacred host, proportional in size to the column, and bears beneath it the inscription, Salus Credentium, Salvation of Believers. The commander of the great ship is the Roman Pontiff. Seeing the enemy's fury and his auxiliary ship's grave predicament, he summons his captains to a conference. However, as they discuss their strategy, a furious storm breaks out and they must return to their ships. When the storm abates, the Pope again summons his captains as the flagship continues. But the storm rages again, and standing at the helm, the Pope strains every muscle to steer his ship between the two calms, from whose tops hang many anchors, and strong hooks linked to chains. The enemy fleet closes in to intercept and sink the flagship at all costs. They bombard it with everything they have, incendiary bombs, firearms, cannons, and every imaginable explosive. Now the battle rages on even more furiously. Pointed iron prows ram the flagship repeatedly, but to no avail. Unscathed and undaunted, it keeps on its course. At times, a formidable ram splinters a gaping hole in its hull. However, a breeze from the two columns immediately seals the gash. Meanwhile, enemy cannons blow up, firearms break and fall to pieces, and ships crack in two and sink to the bottom of the ocean. In blind fury, the enemy resorts to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, cursing and blaspheming. Suddenly, the Pope falls, seriously wounded. He is instantly helped up, but struck down again, then dies. A shout of victory rises from the enemy, and wild rejoicing sweeps their ships. But no sooner is the Pope dead than another one takes his place. The captains of the auxiliary ships elected him so quickly that the news of the Pope's death coincided with that of his successor's election. The enemy's self-assurance wanes pitifully as they feel victory slip through their fingers. Breaking through all resistance, the new Pope steers his ship safely between the columns and moors it to both of them, first to the one with the sacred host and then to the other that is topped by the statue of the Virgin. At this point, something unexpected happens. The enemy ships panic and disperse, colliding with and sinking each other. 
Some auxiliary ships, which had gallantly fought alongside their flagship, were the first to tie up at the two columns. Many others had fearfully kept far away from the fight, cautiously waiting until the wrecked enemy ships vanished under the waves. Then they too head for the two columns, tie up at the swinging hooks, and ride safely and tranquilly beside their flagship. A great calm now covers the sea. Father Rua asked Don Bosco, what do you make of this? He answered, I think that the flagship symbolizes the church commanded by the Pope. The ships represent mankind, and the sea is an image of the world. The flagship's defenders are the laity loyal to the church. The attackers are her enemies who strive with every weapon to destroy her. The two calms, I'd say, symbolize devotion to Mary and the Blessed Sacrament. Father Rua didn't mention the Pope who fell and died. Don Bosco kept silent on this point, simply adding, Very well, Father, except for one thing. The enemy ships symbolize persecutions. Extremely grave trials await the church. What we have suffered so far is almost nothing compared to what will happen. The enemies of the church are symbolized by the ships which attempt to sink the flagship. Only two things can save us in such a grave hour, devotion to Our Lady and frequent Holy Communion. Let's do our best to use these two means and encourage others to use them everywhere. Good night. In this Don Bosco story, we'll hear how the Blessed Virgin Mary gave advice to each oratory boy as a gift for Christmas. These messages were very sobering and could be applied to our own lives. You're watching The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. After Christmas 1861, Don Bosco was stricken with a skin infection and was bedridden for a few days. However, against everyone's advice, as they feared he would get worse, he rose on the evening of December 31st and went down to the parlor to greet his dear young people gathered there and give them advice for the year 1862. This talk was referred to as Astrena, which in English means gift. At the same time, he promised to give each of them a particularly wonderful and extraordinary gift the next day. At the sound of the rising bell, the Angelus, Don Bosco received a command to go immediately to church to celebrate Holy Mass. This he asserted himself, but would not say from whom, though it's clear it came from above. So he did. Afterward, he came to the refectory for coffee. He also went to lunch with the others. And, sure of recovery, he sent away all the medicines and dismissed the doctor. One cannot describe the commotion caused by Don Bosco's promise of Estrena. With what impatience they spent the night from December 31st to January 1st and the following day. With what anxiety they waited for the evening to hear what the good father would tell them. Finally, after the prayers, the young people waited in silence for Don Bosco to mount the podium. The saint began, The strona I am giving you is not mine. What would you say if Our Lady came in person to each of you to say a word? If she had prepared for each of you her note to indicate to him what he most needs or what she wants from him? Well, that's exactly what happened. Our Lady gives each one a strona. First of all, however, I want to put some conditions on you. The first one is that you do not disclose the fact outside the house because I could be compromised. The second is this. Whoever wants to believe, let them believe. And if anyone does not want to believe, tear up your note and pay no attention. But don't mock the others at all and beware of ridiculing them. I see that some will want to know and ask how this happen. Did Our Lady herself write the note? Did Our Lady herself speak to Don Bosco? Is Don Bosco Our Lady's secretary? I answer, I will tell you nothing more than what I have told you. I wrote the notes myself, but how this came about I can't say, nor let there be anyone who will take it upon himself to question me, 
for it would put me in a difficult position. Let each one be content to know that the note is from Our Lady. I have been asking for this grace for several years, and have finally obtained it. Let each of you, therefore, consider that note as if it proceeded from the very mouth of the Virgin Mary. I recommend that each one read his own and communicate it to a friend of his, or maybe tear it up if he wishes after reading it, but take care not to mock it. However, I urge you to keep it with great care because I can't keep a copy. I assure you that even I don't know what's written on each note, and which one belongs to which one of you in particular. I have written them in a notebook, and next to the note I wrote the name of each young man. Then I cut out the note and kept nothing but the name so that whoever loses it or forgets it, that's the end. Since it'll take a long time to give them out, I'll start this evening in my room with all the priests, clerics, and even laymen. Rest well. The clerics, priests, and lay Salesians accompanied Don Bosco to his room and had begun to receive the first fruits of those precious strenae. Father Benetti's recommendation in his chronicle added, O oh, sweetest mother of mine, who gave me such dear advice, also give me the means to accomplish it, and let me truly increase this beautiful number of young men in heaven, but let me also be included in it. February 1862 but what, then, happened on that memorable night? Upon examining the notebook to which Don Bosco alluded, which is preserved in the archives, one can reasonably reproduce what happened and what could not be told by Don Bosco. He was seated at the little table before midnight, when all of a sudden an apparition and a command made him hurriedly take up the first notebook that came to his hand. He then wrote the names of all the youth and all the other people who were in the oratory, but in no alphabetical order. As a name was written, he wrote the corresponding advice that was suggested to him. The name and advice were always contained in one line. Such lines occupied around 20 non-consecutive sheets on one side. There are 573 sentences, or advices, or warnings about things to be practiced or to be avoided, precise, different, and adapted to the needs of each one, encouragement to the good, reproaches to the bad or negligent. It would have been a considerable amount of work, and one would say an impossible task to accomplish this in one evening. It's understood that if his hand wrote these, another person was the mind that dictated them. In fact, as you will see, Certain pieces of advice revealed secrets to be understood and pondered only by those who received them. A strange case happened in those days. Two young miscreants, as Don Bosco narrated several times, conspired to go to his room when he was not there to observe the notebook and see whether there was anything in it about them, or at least to read the advice before they were distributed. And so they managed to get hold of that notebook and eagerly flipped through the pages, but to their surprise, they saw them all blank. So they placed the notebook back where they found it, without having been able to discover anything at all. Don Bosco then narrated to all the assembled youth how those two curious people had been punished by God. Years later, Father Joachim Berto confirmed the same thing with his own words. The young men, meanwhile, hurriedly crowded, somewhat anxiously, to the door of Don Bosco's room to receive their note. The impressions made by these gifts were significant, and the good it produced can't be imagined. The first effect of these gifts was a continuous stream of boys going to confession. For several days, the boys flocked to Don Bosco's room to get their own note. In those days, some were beside themselves with joy. Some were pensive. Some wept, others stood alone. Some showed their advice to their companions, but others kept it jealously hidden. The cleric Dominic Rufino collected as many notes as he could to copy and save them for the future. Forty-eight boys accepted to give them, but, with few exceptions, the other 525 were not asked or preferred to keep the mysterious notes to themselves. Some hesitated to pick up their note for fear it contained an excruciating truth. After a while, some of them finally went to pick it up, 
but 13 never did. Here is the tenor of the notes collected and preserved. I quote them here, omitting the names. Your negligence, combined with lack of piety, displeases me. Wake up. You could do far more for the good of your soul. Have recourse to me more often. Fight, and I will help you win. A worm is gnawing at your soul and body. Woe to you if you don't destroy it. Choose better companions. Don't be negligent. Pray better. Endeavor to repair the past with a better future. Why wait? You love idleness and want to pamper your taste, but you displease me and my son Jesus Christ. Woe to you if you do not amend. Your carelessness makes your labors useless. Flee idleness. Study and pray. Frequent the sacraments. Pray better. Be more obedient. Put your conscience in order. Make better use of your time. Pray better. Idleness and gluttony make me worry over you. Amend and pray better. You are very concerned about your body and little about your soul. Death is approaching. Get ready. Meditate more on eternal things. Be constant in piety. Why do you have recourse to me so seldom? In this mystical dream of St. John Bosco, he's literally flown to a mysterious palace to hear advice from a bishop who had been long dead on how to avoid purgatory. You're watching The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Don Bosco spoke to the whole community after evening prayers. He said, Last night, not being able to sleep, I began thinking about the existence of the soul, how it was made, in what way it could speak in the afterlife while separated from the body. How could it transport itself from one place to another? How would we be able to know one another after death, since we exist only as pure spirits? And the more I thought about this, the more obscure the mystery became in my mind. So, while thinking about this and similar ideas, I fell asleep and seemed to be traversing countries unknown to me. Then, all of a sudden, I heard my name called. It was the voice of a person standing on the road. Come with me, he said. You will now be able to see what you desire. I obeyed, and we moved swiftly without our feet touching the ground. We then reached an unknown location, and my guide stopped. High above was a magnificent palace. I no longer remember whether it was on a mountain or a cloud. It was inaccessible, and no road could be seen leading to it. Go up to that palace, said the guide. How? I haven't got wings, I responded. Go up, he commanded. Seeing I didn't move, he said, Do as I do. Raise your arms and come with me. So we lifted his hands toward heaven. I opened my arms and immediately felt lifted through the air. In a few brief moments, we reached the palace gates. What's in here? I asked. Go in and you'll see. At the end of the hall, someone will teach you. The guide disappeared and I remained alone, so I entered and climbed the stairs. I passed through spacious halls, ornate rooms, and long corridors with supernatural speed. Every room glittered with splendor and astonishing treasures, and with great speed I moved through so many rooms that I couldn't even count them all. But the most admirable thing was that I was moving with the swiftness of the wind, but didn't move my feet because I was suspended in the air without touching the floor. Finally, I came to a great hall that was more magnificent than all the others. At the end, I saw a bishop who was waiting as if to give an audience. I approached respectfully and was surprised to recognize him as an intimate friend who died two years ago. He looked healthy, friendly, and very handsome. Your Excellency, is it really you? I said to him with great joy. Can't you see it's me? replied the bishop. 
Are you still alive? But didn't you die? I am dead. Because if you're alive, another bishop has taken your place. How shall we deal with this problem? Rest assured, I'm dead. And you, Don Bosco, are you dead or alive? I I'm alive. Can't you see I'm here in body and soul? But you cannot come here with your body. Yet, here I am. It seems you are, but you are not. I interrupted him, and I had to ask many unanswered questions. How can it be that I'm alive with you who are already dead? I feared the bishop would disappear, so I begged him, Your Excellency, please don't leave me. I have so many things to ask. Be calm, my son. Don't doubt. I won't leave. Speak. Are you saved? Look at me. See how well I am, fresh and resplendent? His appearance truly gave me hope that he was saved, but I insisted, Tell me, are you saved, yes or no? Yes, I am in a place of salvation. Are you in heaven, enjoying the Lord, or in purgatory? I am in a place of salvation, but I have not yet seen God, and I still need your prayers. How much longer will you be in purgatory? He handed me a paper and said, Read this. I took the paper in my hand and looked at it carefully, but I saw nothing written on it, only floral designs, and said, I see nothing on it. The bishop looked at that paper and said, Turn the paper upside down. I examined the paper more carefully and turned it every which way, but it seemed that among the floral designs was only the number two. The bishop continued, Do you know why it's necessary to read this upside down? The judgments of the Lord are different from the world's judgments. What men think is wisdom is foolishness to God. I dared not press for a more precise explanation and said, Your Excellency, I want to ask you some other questions. Ask away. I'll listen. Will I be saved? You must hope, my son. Please tell me if I will be saved. I don't know. At least tell me whether I am or, or am not in God's grace. I don't know. But will my boys be saved? You have studied theology, and you can answer that yourself. You're in a place of salvation, Your Excellency, and you don't know these things? The Lord makes known to whoever He wills. If He wants this knowledge communicated, He gives the order and permission. Otherwise, no one can reveal it to the living. Many, many questions came to mind, and I asked them in haste for fear the bishop would withdraw. Tell me a few things to report to the boys from you. You know as well as I do what must be done. The church, the gospel, and the scriptures tell you everything. Tell them to save their souls, because the rest counts for nothing. We already know that we have to save our souls, but how are we to do this? Tell me something special we can remember that I can tell my boys on your behalf. Tell them to be good and obedient. And who doesn't know these things, Your Excellency? How about something else? Tell them to be modest and to pray. But can you explain that more practically? Tell them to confess often and make good communions. Something else, Your Excellency. Tell them that they have a fog before their eyes. If they are aware of it, it's a good sign. So let them remove it. But what is this fog, Your Excellency? It's all the things of the world which prevent them from seeing heavenly things as they are. And how are they to remove this fog? Let them consider the world as it is. The whole world is under the influence of the evil one. Only then will they save their souls. Let them not be deceived by the appearances of the world. Young people believe that the world's pleasures, joys, and friendships are the only things that can make them happy, so they only spend their time enjoying these pleasures. But let them remember that everything is vanity and affliction of spirit. Let them form the habit to see the things of the world not as they appear, but as they are. But what causes this fog, Your Excellency? The virtue that shines brightest in heaven is purity, so the sin of immodesty and impurity 
mainly produce this darkness and fog. It's like a very dense black cloud that takes away sight and prevents young people from seeing the precipice to which they are speedily heading. Tell them to persevere in the virtue of purity jealously. The pure shall flourish like the lily. At this, Don Bosco asked, What does it take to preserve purity? Tell me, and I will announce it to my dear boys. The bishop responded, Four things. Prayer, obedience, avoiding idleness, and flight from worldly things. Nothing else? Prayer, avoiding idleness, obedience, and flight from worldly things. Insist on it. That is enough. I still wanted to ask many things, but none came to mind, unfortunately. So as soon as the bishop had finished speaking, I was eager to tell you the advice he had given me, so I left that great hall quickly and ran to the oratory. I flew with the swiftness of the wind, and in an instant I was at the door of the oratory. When I arrived, I stopped and thought, why didn't I stay longer with the bishop? I would have had even better clarifications. I was wrong to let such a good opportunity escape me. I could have learned so many more good things. I turned to go back, but bumped my knee into something, and I awoke. Remember that this is a dream like all other dreams, and as far as you are concerned, it needs no explanation. We're still quite imperfect, and have remnants of sin to atone for, and habits to give up. So even though we've gone to confession many times, we still must atone for our sins. Therefore, purgatory is the perfect place that God and his mercy has created to purify us. Thus, Don Bosco finished his extraordinary speech to his community. Thank you all so much for watching. God bless you and Our Lady keep you. Anyone who's read The 40 Dreams of St. John Bosco is familiar with his phrase, I stayed up late writing. Well, what did he write? Hardly anyone has heard of the prodigious amounts of wonderful literature penned by him. For instance, did you know that he wrote about Islam, or Mohammedanism, as they called it back then? In his late 1853 work, The Catholic Instructed in His Religion, he teaches doctrine through telling the story of a father having a conversation with his son about a variety of Catholic topics. We'll now hear how he sums up Islam in this episode of The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Undoubtedly, no knowledge is more important for a Catholic than that of his religion, the Father began. It's a vital and most consoling knowledge because its foundations are so certain and clear that they make us discern the hand of divine providence from every standpoint. The religion of Jesus Christ, uniquely preserved in the Roman Catholic Church, according to the words of the same Savior, will be persecuted in every way, but never defeated. At all times, amid the bloodiest of persecutions, it's preserved as an always glorious, visible, and victorious immovable pillar using no weapons other than charity and patience. Such invariability has held her together from the time of Jesus Christ till now and can only be attributed to divine omnipotence. Having established the foundations of our holy Roman Catholic religion, I want to talk to you about some curious events religions that were once united to the Catholic Church, but later separated from her. That sounds splendid, said his son, Michele. I've wanted to know this for a long time. Don Bosco doesn't name him in the original story, but I think it's better if we give the son a name. What are these religions that separated from the Catholic Church? Well, his father began, before talking about the religions that separated from the Roman Catholic Church, just let me call your attention to religions that lack the characteristics of divinity, which we call false religions. They range from Judaism to idolatry to Mohammedanism and Christian sects professed by schismatic Greeks, Valdes, Anglicans, and Protestants. If you like, I'll now tell you about the others, beginning with Mohammedanism. Why, yes, said Michele, but what does the name Mohammedanism mean? 
Mohammedanism is a collection of maxims drawn from various religions, explained his father. If practiced, it brings about the destruction of every moral principle. What countries believe in it? Michieli asked. Large parts of Asia and parts of Africa. Remember, this is in 1853. Who started it? Why, Mohammed, of course. Well, tell me everything about this Mohammed, then. It would take far too long to recount all the stories about this infamous impostor, his father sighed. I'll just tell you who he was and how he established his religion instead. Mohammed was born to a poor family of a Gentile father and a Jewish mother in the year 570 in Mecca, an Arabian city not far from the Red Sea. Eager for glory and better living conditions, he wandered around many countries. In Damascus, he became the agent of a merchant's widow, who later married him. He cunningly exploited his illnesses and her ignorance to establish a religion. Suffering from epilepsy, he claimed his frequent falls were ecstasies, in which he had conversations with the angel Gabriel. What an imposter deceiving people like that, exclaimed Michele. Did he try to work miracles to support his preaching? Mohammed wasn't sent by God and so, of course, couldn't work any miracles to support his religion, his father responded. God alone works miracles. However, Mohammed boasted of being greater than Jesus Christ, so they asked him to, of course, work miracles just as Jesus did. He arrogantly replied that Jesus Christ had already performed miracles and God called him, Mohammed, to reestablish the religion by force. But he did claim to have worked just one miracle, restoring a piece of the moon after it fell onto his sleeve. The Muslims made the half moon their emblem to commemorate this ridiculous miracle. Michele guffawed at this absurdity. You're laughing, and rightly so, because a man of this ilk should have been deemed a charlatan rather than the preacher of a new religion. Accordingly, his fellow citizens sought to imprison and kill him, as his reputation as an impostor and disturber of the peace was widely known. However, he managed to escape and took refuge in the city of Medina, along with some libertines who helped him become the ruler of that city. After a few minutes to contemplate all this, Michele asked, So what exactly makes up Muhammad's religion? Well, Muhammad's religion is a monstrous mixture of Judaism, paganism, and Christianity. The Quran, which means the book par excellence, contains Muhammad's laws. This religion is also called Turkish Ottoman, since it's widely diffused in Turkey. Muslim, Musulmana, derives from Mosul, the name Muslims give their prayer director. Islamism, from the name of some of its reformers, it's the same religion Mohammed established. So why did Mohammed mix various religions? Michele asked, now thoroughly confused. Well, since the peoples of Arabia were partly Jews, Christians, and pagans, his father replied, he had to induce them to follow him. So he selected a part of the religion they professed, and particularly the points that most favored sensual pleasures. It sounds like Mohammed was a pretty learned man to do that, remarked Michele. But that's just it, said the father exasperatingly. He wasn't learned at all. He couldn't even write. To compose the Quran, he was assisted by a Jew and an apostate monk. He confused the facts when discussing things in the Holy Scriptures. For example, he attributes to Moses' sister Mary many episodes concerning Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, besides many other appalling errors. Unbelievable, exclaimed Michele wonderingly. How could Muhammad have spread his religion if he was so ignorant and worked no miracles on top of it? Simple, said his father. Muhammad propagated his religion by military force rather than through miracles or persuasion. The fact that his religion favored all kinds of licentiousness quickly enabled him to become the leader of a troop of brigands. With them, he raided eastern countries and conquered peoples, raising a sword over their heads and shouting, Believe or die! He never argued with facts about the truth, prophesied, or worked miracles. What a scoundrel! exclaimed Michele. That's no argument to convert anyone. Being such an ignoramus, Mohammed must have planted many errors in the Quran, right? Absolutely, said his father. 
You could say that the Quran is a series of errors, the most egregious concerning morality and the worship of the true God. So for example, it excuses from sin those who deny God out of fear of death. It allows revenge and promises its followers a paradise filled strictly with earthly pleasures. In short, this false prophet's doctrine permits things so obscene that a Christian soul would be horrified to name them. The difference between the Catholic Church and the Muslim religion is enormous. Muhammad established his religion through violence and arms. Jesus Christ established his church with words of peace, employing his poor disciples. Muhammad incited people's passions. Jesus Christ commanded self-denial. Muhammad worked no miracles. Jesus Christ worked countless miracles in broad daylight and in the presence of big crowds. Muhammad's doctrines are ridiculous, immoral, and corrupting. Jesus Christ's are august, sublime, and pure. In Muhammad, not even one prophecy was fulfilled. In Jesus Christ, all were. In short, after a fashion, the Christian religion makes a man happy in this world to raise him to the enjoyment of heaven. Muhammad degrades and vilifies human nature. And by placing all happiness in sensual pleasures, he lowers people to the level of filthy animals. Don Bosco wrote, One day, Dominic Savio came into my room saying, Quick, come with me. Where? I asked. All he said was, Come, hurry. He led me down several streets without a word and finally rang the bell at an apartment. They need you here, he said, and left. A woman opened the door. Come quickly, she greeted me, or it will be too late. My husband unfortunately became a Protestant. Now he's dying and wants to return to the church. I hastened to his bedside and helped put his conscience in order. He received last rites with a single emergency anointing. Some time later, I asked Savio how he had known about the dying man. He looked at me tearfully and started to cry, so I didn't press the point mindful of the fact that saintly souls find it more painful to reveal God's graces than to confess their sins. St. Dominic Savio was one of St. John Bosco's oratory boys, and they were contemporary, meaning that they lived at the same time. They knew each other very well. So well, in fact, that St. John Bosco even wrote a book about him, and it's from this book that we learn of Dominic Savio's prophetism. He had many visions concerning the persecuted church in England, and even foretold his own death, which is the subject of today's episode of The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Dominic Savio spoke about the Pope as a son would speak of his own father. He prayed fervently for him and expressed a lively longing to be able to see him. He repeatedly asserted that he had something of great importance to tell him. Hearing him speak about the Pope, Don Bosco once asked Dominic Savio what the most significant thing he wished to say to the Pope was. Dominic said, if I could speak to him, I would like to tell him that amid the tribulations that await him, he should not cease to concern himself with England. God is preparing a great triumph for Catholicism in that kingdom. How do you know all this? asked Don Bosco. Dominic replied, I'll tell you, but don't tell it to the others. One morning I was praying after communion. I was surprised by a strong distraction, and I seemed to see a vast plain full of people wrapped in a dense fog. They walked like men who had lost their way because they could no longer see where to go. A voice told me that this country was England. I saw the Supreme Pontiff, Pius IX, as I had seen painted in some pictures. He was dressed majestically, carrying a bright torch, advancing toward that immense crowd. As he approached, the fog disappeared in the glow of that torchlight, and the men remained in the midday light. The same voice told me that this torch is the Catholic religion that must enlighten the English. Dominic Savio also foretold his own death. The young men in the oratory did an exercise asking for a good death at the beginning of the year. Savio jokingly repeated several times, 
Instead of praying for the one who will be the first to die, say a pater and ave for Dominic Savio, who will be the next to go. Dominic hadn't been feeling well, and sometime before, Don Bosco had already sent him home, hoping that the native air would do him good. And with displeasure, Dominic obeyed. He arrived by coach to Castelnuovo and was forced to continue on foot to Mondonio because a letter announcing his arrival had not yet been delivered to his parents. He arrived home tired from the long way, and upon seeing him, his mother asked, You came alone? Had you no one for a companion? Dominic replied, I got out of the coach and immediately found a beautiful and stately lady who had the goodness to accompany me as far as the door of our house. But why did you not let her in? asked his mother, inviting her to rest. He replied, as I neared the village, she disappeared and I saw her no more. The good mother had an idea that the lady was Mary Most Holy. After a few days, Dominic returned to the oratory. He wished to continue his studies and usual practices of piety. Don Bosco would have kept him, but he wanted to follow the doctor's advice, all the more so since incessant coughing had been developing in him for some days. Dominic surrendered to this resolution, but only to make a sacrifice. He was asked why he went home in such a bad mood. They said, you should go home with happiness to enjoy the company of your beloved parents. He answered, I wish to end my days at the oratory. You should go home, they said, and after you've recovered in health, you can return. Oh no, he replied, I'm leaving and will not return. The evening before his departure, he had much to ask Don Bosco, and the questions he asked were, what's the best thing a sick person can do to merit before God? To offer frequently to God how much he suffers, replied Don Bosco. What else? Offer his life to the Lord. Can I be assured that I have been forgiven my sins? I assure you that your sins have been forgiven in God's name. But can I be certain that I am saved? You will undoubtedly be saved through divine mercy, which you don't lack. If the devil comes to tempt me, what shall I tell him? You will tell him that you have sold your soul to Jesus Christ and that he has bought it with the price of his blood to deliver you from hell and lead you to heaven. From heaven will I be able to see my oratory companions and my parents? Yes, from heaven you will see all the affairs of the oratory. You will see your parents, the things that concern them, and other things a thousand times even more beautiful. Will I be able to come and pay them some visits? You may come as long as it's for the glory of God. He kept asking many questions, and he seemed like someone who already had one foot on the gate of heaven and wanted to inquire about the things within it before entering. On the morning of his departure, he joined his companions in the exercise of the good death with great devotion. Then he talked with them one by one, giving each a word of advice. He spoke to the confreres of the Society of the Immaculate Conception and with the most animated expressions encouraged them to observe the promises made to Mary Most Holy constantly and to place the liveliest confidence in her. At the moment of departure, he called Don Bosco and told him, Since you don't want this carcass of mine, I'm obliged to take it to Mondonio. It would only be a few days, then it'll be all over. Nevertheless, God's will be done. If you go to Rome, remember to tell the Pope about England. Pray I may have a good death and I'll see you again in heaven." He asked Don Bosco if he could receive the plenary indulgence at the hour of death, the blessing that Don Bosco had obtained from the Pope, and kissed Don Bosco's hand for the last time. When he reached home, the doctor judged him to be suffering from inflammation and bled him. The doctor and his relatives thought that the illness had improved, but Dominic judged differently. Guided by the thought that it's better to receive than lose the sacraments, he called his father. We should consult the heavenly physician. I wish to confess and receive Holy Communion. He received Holy Viaticum with the fervor of a seraphim. After a few days, Dominic asked for the anointing of the sick to be administered to him 
and the relatives and the pastor granted his request. He also asked for the papal blessing. Armed with all the comforts of holy religion, he experienced a heavenly joy that can't be described. It was the evening of March 9th, and those who heard him speak and beheld his face thought that he was resting. No one suspected that he was on the verge of death. An hour and a half before he died, the pastor visited him and was happy to hear him commend his soul to God. Dominic clasped and kissed the crucifix in his hands and prayed fervent ejaculations expressing the keenest desire to go to heaven. The pastor left expecting to see him again. The young man fell asleep and took half an hour's rest. Then, waking up, he looked at his relatives. Papa, he said, this is it. My dear father, it's time. Take the companion of youth and read me the prayers for a good death. At these words, his mother broke into tears and left the room. With sorrow, the father took courage and read the prayers, Dominic carefully and distinctly repeating each word. Then, after a few moments, he opened his eyes, smiling, and in a clear voice said, Farewell, dear father. Ah, what a beautiful thing it is that I see. He expired with his hands clasped on his chest in the form of a cross. On the evening of March 9, 1857, there was one less angel on earth and one more in heaven. Thank you all so much for watching. God bless you and Our Lady keep you. St. Dominic Savio, pray for us.